we meditate so we can put an end to the sufferings in our lives, in particular the unnecessary sufferings that the mind imposes on itself. And as it turns out, those are the sufferings that weigh down the mind. Without those sufferings, there's no problem. So how does the meditation do this? We make the mind quiet so we can see the mind in action. So on the one hand, we have a sense of well-being, a sense of ease, a sense of feeling home in the present moment. So we become more and more sensitive to what's going on in the mind, what the mind is doing in the present moment. In fact, the process of getting the mind to settle down is like peeling away the layers of an onion. First you deal with the really blatant distractions, the blatant things that are irritating the mind. Thoughts about your work, thoughts about your home, thoughts about all kinds of things, all the different hindrances. Sure, clear those away. The mind gets into concentration, but even then it's not fully settled down. You still need some directed thought and evaluation to, on the one hand, fend off any distractions, and on the other to massage the object of your concentration so it becomes more and more amenable. We think about the breath, we evaluate the breath. So we're going to figure out what ways of breathing are really comfortable right here and which ones are not. And then you evaluate how you can expand that sense of comfort so it fills the whole body. And become more and more sensitive to the different ways that breath energy flows in the body. You learn how to distinguish between the flow of the blood and the flow of the breath. They are two different things, but they're very closely associated. When the breath flows well, the blood flows well. But sometimes you'll find that an energy flow goes into part of the body, and instead of feeling better, all of a sudden there's a lot of pressure. Well, that's blood. It's a liquid. It's running up against the solidity of the blood vessels, and so there's pressure. The breath, though, doesn't have pressure. It can flow anywhere. It can flow through atoms. After all, it is an energy. When you make that distinction, you find that it's easier to spread the breath around. Then it gets into more and more refined areas of the body, all little nooks and crannies, all the way out to every pore. There'll be a sense of rapture that goes along with this. The rapture is the sense of the movement of the energy, and it feels refreshing. But then after all, you decide the rapture isn't all that calming. You want something even more still, more silent. So you tune into a deeper level. You keep on going in this way. As some concentration gets more settled and refined, you begin to discern things that you didn't see before, subtle levels of stress you didn't see. And this is one of the reasons why inconstancy is one of the themes, not only of insight, but also to assist in your meditation, assist in your concentration. The Buddha taught Rahula the theme of inconstancy even before he taught him breath meditation. So you can learn to look for the little ups and downs. And the stress level goes up in the mind, what did you just do? When it goes down, what did you just do? You want to see what causes led to the ups and downs in the stress. The next question is, are those mental activities? And that's what you're looking for, are the actions of the mind. And it's very important when you get the mind still, as you don't try to interpret it as some sort of great spiritual attainment in the sense of tapping into some ground of being or your true self or 
cosmic oneness or primordial emptiness. Those big titles tend to blind you to what's actually going on. You want to see what you're doing and what you're experiencing as the result of actions. There are movements in the mind, perceptions, thought constructs, acts of fabrication that get you to those states and can keep you there. And there'll be a slight inconstancy there. The more subtle the concentration, of course, the more subtle the inconstancy, but it's still there. You have to learn how to see it. As you go from one level of concentration to another, sometimes you have to adjust. It's like adjusting your eyes when you go from a dark room to a very bright room, and then from the bright room even to an even brighter room. You have to stay with these levels so that you can get used to seeing, okay, where are you doing something to keep this going? At this point, we're far away from the hindrances, and the only real disturbance is the only real stress is what the mind is doing right here, right now, to maintain its concentration. And you see an unnecessary action that creates unnecessary stress, you can let it go. Now, why does this have an impact that goes all the way through the mind and affects even your strong greed, aversion, and delusion? Because there's a common pattern to all our suffering. It's analogous to eating. Just as the body needs to feed, the mind needs to feed, and it's in the act of feeding that we suffer. But this is so basic to us that this is how we identify ourselves. We identify ourselves around the way we feed on physical food mental food, emotional food. When the Buddha talked about his ability to remember previous lifetimes, it was all pretty simple. He had this name, he had this appearance, he had this experience of pleasure and pain, he ate this food, and then he died. That's life. Life centers around eating, eating, eating. And again, it's not just physical food, it's mental and emotional food. And the Buddha talked about our sense of self, and it's in terms of the functions of the mind that surround the act of feeding. In Pali, they're called khandas. In English, we call them aggregates. For a long time, I wondered why aggregate was chosen to translate the word khanda. It sounds like piles of gravel. And there is that image in the Pali. It's a heap, it's a pile. But why aggregate? It turns out, back in the 19th century, they made a distinction between organic unity, when you had an organism where everything functioned together, and collections that were just aggregates, they called them. In other words, things that were piled together without having any real interrelationship. And so when they chose aggregate to translate kanda, it was to convey the sense that your sense of self has lots of little bits and pieces of things, but there's no real organic unity here. And so what are these little bits and pieces? Well, there's a sense of form, and there are feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, and consciousness. And these are related to how you, how you eat. Each of these is actually an activity, even form. Is something that you create through having that perception that there is a form here, there is a body here. And it keeps changing. Yet you maintain this sense of this is one form that goes through time. And so you've got this form that needs to be maintained, needs to feed. So you've got the form of the food out there. Then there are feelings. On the one hand, there's the feeling of hunger you feel when you're lacking something. This applies not only to the body, but also the mind. And then there's the feeling of fullness and satisfaction that comes when that hunger has been met. And there's perception, one, perceiving the type of hunger you're feeling, and two, perceiving what's actually food out there that you can eat, feed on. This is basically how we get to know the world. Little children, we crawl around, what do we do? We find something, we stick it in our mouths. 
in hopes that it might be food. And over time we learn that marbles are not food, little toys are not food. And it's the perception that we have to hold in mind as to what is and is not food that will, will or will not satisfy our hunger. And this fabrication, when you've got some food, can you just take it as it is? No, you've got to work with it. You've got to figure out how to get it. And then once you've got it, what do you have to do with it? Some foods you can just stick in your mouth as they are, others you've got to fix. That's fabrication. Then finally there's consciousness, the awareness of all these properties, of all these activities. That too is a part of the feeding process. So these are the things that go into feeding, and they're also the things that make up our sense of who we are. Sometimes we identify with the feelings, sometimes with the perception, sometimes with different mixtures of these things. But that's our sense of self. And where do we see this directly? We see this in the process of getting the mind into concentration. We've got our laboratory right here. We've got our test case right here. You get the mind still. You've got the form, which is the breath coming in and out, which gives you your sense of the body. Without the movement of the breath energy in the body, you wouldn't have a sense of form. Try it sometime. Get the mind really, really still, so still that you don't need to breathe. And you find that your sense of form begins to disintegrate first into a little cloud of sensation dots or sensation droplets, like a mist. And the sense of boundary or edge around the form gets very vague, cloud-like. And you realize it was because of the movement of the breath that you had a sense of the shape where your arms were, where your legs were, and everything. But when that breath movement grows still, there's nothing to confirm the perception of form, and so you drop it. So you've got the breath as form, then you've got the feelings, of course, that come with the breath, either comfort or discomfort, the perceptions that hold you with the breath, and the various ways of perceiving the breath to allow you to get into deeper and deeper states of concentration. Well, you can drop the breath and go into formless states. You've got perceptions of infinite space or infinite consciousness, nothingness. This fabrication. In the beginning it's verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation. It allows you to settle down. And then it gets more and more refined. In the later stages of concentration, there, this kind of fabrication gets used again as you pull yourself slightly out of one particular state of concentration so that you can analyze it from within. It's like having your hand in a glove. If it's fully in, you can't really do any analysis in some of the stronger states of concentration, but you pull it out a little bit. So even though your hand is still in the glove, it's not still fully inside it. In the same way you can pull out a little bit from the concentration, not destroy it, you can analyze it. And then of course there's the consciousness. So you've got all the aggregates right here in a very pure form, very immediate form, something you can observe right here, right now, as the mind is quiet, so you can see the interactions. And so what you've got to learn how to do is get the mind really enamored with this practice first. So you can use it to pry away your, your hunger for other things. You've got the, the jhana as food, and the Buddha talks about this many times. So when you're fed with this, you're not so hungry for things outside. You're not so hungry for sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. And it's easier to see them as in that passage from the Sutta we chanted just now, that they are on fire. You realize that all the pleasure and pain you got in them was, was on fire. It makes you less interested in them, and as a result, your attachment to the concentration gets stronger. Now there's healthy attachment and pathological attachment. Pathological is when you just want to hide away in the concentration and don't want to do your duties, you don't want to engage with the world. 
that's unhealthy. You have to realize that the problem is not with the world outside, it's with the irritability of the mind inside. You've got to learn how to use your concentration to strengthen you in your dealings with the world outside. So that you're not weak in the face of unpleasant things. You can actually strengthen yourself to withstand these things better as you do your duties. Healthy attachment is when you realize you really want to find your happiness here, and you learn how to maintain a sense of a still center as you go through the world and are doing your duties. Whenever there's a free moment, you come back to the breath. Get as much energy and much as much refreshment as you can out of it. That way you really familiarize yourself with these aggregates as they're present in the state of the jhana. And ultimately there comes a point when you begin to develop a sense of disenchantment with them. Again, the word disenchantment, nibbida, is related to a sense of the sense you have when you've had enough of a particular kind of food. You love cheesecake and you ate cheesecake and finally you look at it and you can't stand cheesecake anymore. From that comes dispassion. And the dispassion is important because our continued fabrication, and this applies to all the aggregates, is fed by passion. It's because we're feeding on these things, getting food out of them, that we keep engaging them. But then when you realize that they're, they themselves are not worth hanging on to and the food they provide is not worth hang, hang, hanging on to, why bother? That's when the mind can let go. And because it has been letting go of other things, this act of letting go is special. If it's not, then you simply go into another level of concentration. But when it's really special, you, you do something that you've never done before. There's been a moment of absolutely no intention, no fabrication at all. And that opens things up in the mind. That's how you find the deathless. So this is why jhana is so important for giving rise to insight, because it allows you to see precisely where you've been holding on and why you've been holding on. It's a test case for all the suffering that's created by this felt need to feed, 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 eat, nibble, whatever, all the time. And even though we tend to get a lot of our pleasure in life out of feeding, after all, they were saying that people who are held in concentration camps are people held in prison or war camps. In the very beginning they talk about sex, after all they lose their interest in sex, but they talk about food all the time, because that's what the mind is most obsessed with. Well. You make jhana your food here as you're meditating. And that gives you a test case for why is it that we like to feed, and is there a possibility that we could find happiness without feeding? In the course of that, our sense of our identity around the act of feeding begins to get more turned into aggregates. That solid sense of self begins to dissolve away. And even, even though the idea, if you ask people at the beginning, would you like to find true happiness, but it would re involve letting go of your sense of identity, most people would say, no, it's not worth it. But as you approach it in a strategic way, first getting people attached to the jhana and then seeing what happens to their sense of self, they're less attached to it. They see that it really wasn't worth feeding on after all. That's how we take this whole mass of suffering apart. But the key element here is getting the mind to really settle down so it's really solid in the present moment and can see these things clearly.
That's the part of the path you can't do without.